Father, we worship you today and we give you praise. <laughs> yeah, the word investment keeps sticking with me for some reason. But I know why. We'll see how the Holy Spirit brings it back up today. Just, if you would, just lift your hands in the presence of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. I did not say bow your heads. I did not say close your eyes. I said lift your hands. Now, I hear the Lord say this because it's time for us to be more attuned to the spirit of the Lord. It does make a difference what we do. It does make a difference what we hear. And I'm not saying anything against anybody that did that, but listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, Amen. to the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, we lift our hands to you today and we give you praise. I thank you, God, that as we come into this place, we, we have declared it to be sanctified and set apart for your use. I don't care what event took place here last night, last week, doesn't matter. It is your place, your time to speak in this place to your people. Your people are hungry. They've come not to hear me. They've come to hear from you. And I, as your servant, your son, Lord God, as a vessel, I release myself from all condemnation of man. I bind the spirit of the enemy that would bring criticism and judgment against the people of God. I thank you, God, that nobody sits in judgment of another, but rather we hear the word and we receive it by the, by the filter of the Holy Ghost and not our minds only. So speak, Lord, in this place. Bring restoration to your people. Bring us out of a place of bondage into a place of freedom that Jesus promised us when he, before he went to the cross. And let our minds be enlightened by the power of the great Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, you are the preeminent guest here. We welcome you and the angelic host to minister, to bring deliverance, God, and do what you do best. By your power, release us from the bondage of the enemy and the bondage of our past. If you can receive that, why don't you say amen? Amen. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Romans. Oh, praise God. Um, had a great time on last weekend for those of you maybe who couldn't, have, couldn't make it. Um, but I pray and trust that your reason for not assembling was more than you just didn't feel like coming to church. We're going to take the gloves off this morning, Robin. We're going to take the gloves off. Amen. Because it's time for us to grow up. Tell your neighbor it's time for me to grow up. Tell that same neighbor it's time for you to grow up in Jesus' name. We're growing up in Christ Jesus, amen? We're not growing up just getting older, getting wider. We are growing up in Jesus Christ, amen? And in growing up, we recognize that there's some things that must happen. The Bible declares that in Jesus, turn to Romans, the 12th chapter, if you would, as you're turning. It talks about in Jesus, and when Jesus ascended into heaven in the book of Acts, that the angels declared that he is going to be, and I don't, forgive me if I don't quote it directly, if I, if I don't, and you don't like it too bad, get over it, grow up. Uh, but there was a time of his departure that had to be there until the heavens had to receive him until the time that he was released by the Father to come back to the earth. Okay? And so if there's a season in, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, it speaks to a plan of the Father. Each one of us, there's a plan of the Father for our lives. If, if there wasn't, you wouldn't be here today. And what the difference in you and your brothers and sisters that couldn't make it this morning, because a lot of brothers and sisters that should be here aren't here, and they stand at home right now watching TV, watching the broadcast, and the broadcast doesn't replace your being in fellowship with the believers. Amen. Amen. You know, if you 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 know, there's one thing to go to school online, but most schools online, if you're getting a degree online, they still require that you come walk. Or that you come show up. Am I right about it? Yeah. Because they want to see that you're a real person. Yeah. And they want to know that you have, you have a, 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 you know, not just going to get a degree, but you have a plan. Yeah. And you understand what that plan is. And God is the one who has the plan for us. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. So I want to talk this morning. I'm going to start off here, and I'm going to go to a couple different places. Uh, give me 45 minutes on the clock, please, if we could. All right. I'll do my best to try to keep to that 45 minutes. Amen. Uh, we're going to talk about restoration to harvest. This is introduction part two. 
Restoration to Harvest. This is the, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, last week, last time I spoke to you was in Induction Part 2. This is rest Restoration to Harvest Part 1. We actually moved into the body of it now. Amen? The subtitle of this message this morning is Identity Crisis. Identity Crisis. Say that with me. Identity, Identity Crisis. crisis. I'll stop right there for right now. All right? And again, we've been talking about from restoration to harvest in 2019. So as I look at this, I'm going to say a couple things. I'm going to read Rome, uh, Romans 12 and just get two verses of Scripture here. And I'm going to read it from the Expanded Bible. It says, so therefore, brothers and sisters, since God has shown us great mercy, not just mercy, but great mercy. There's a difference in mercy and great mercy. And I believe the Apostle Paul knows the difference, amen? He says, I beg you to offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him. Your offering must be only for God and pleasing to him, which is the spiritual, right? True, appropriate, fitting, reasonable, some say reasonable service, way for you to worship. Verse 2, do not be shaped by this world age. Instead, be changed Within, say within, yeah. say transformed yeah. by a new way of thinking or changing the way you think, the renewing of your mind. Then, can I emphasize this? It doesn't say this here, but if I add it for you, those of you that are biblical scholars, would I be wrong in saying then he says then I'm going to say and only then. Is that OK? Then and only then. Hallelujah. He says then you will be able to decide or discern, put to the test and approve what God wants for you. Mm -hmm. You will know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. If you will know what is perfect, there's a, there's a, 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 a tendency by inference by the Apostle Paul that you might step into something that's not perfect. Look up at me. Stop reading. I've stopped reading. You stop reading. <laughs> Just messing with y'all. Most of us have dealt with this one thing, and this is, the, again, the, the, the main crux of this message today. Most of us have dealt with and have had an identity crisis at one point or another in our lives. You ain't even got to say anything. I know it's true. A lot of us are still struggling with who we are in God. When I hear people say to me, they might say to me, Pastor, they might say to you, I don't know what God has called me to do. Well, what that tells me, based on what I just read here in, in Paul's writing, it tells me that they have not fully submitted themselves and become transformed into the image of God. Is that a reasonable conclusion? Thank you very much. Because the hypothesis here is that somehow or another, we think that God has to do something more in us than what he's already done but he's done everything that he could possibly do in sending Jesus Christ to us for, for, for the forgiveness of our sin, the washing away of all knowledge of sin, and then transform us. The transformation process is ours, not God's. But you can't do it without it. Amen. So with that being said, remember, remember when, I don't know, I mean, I think it was when my kids were younger, they had this little toy out. I wish I had one, but I don't have one. They had this little toy out, and I'm sure they're still out, where this thing looked like a robot, right? But with it being a robot coming out of the package, the whole essence of the toy is that it could, it could be flipped and turned and manipulated by the hands of the child, and it turns it into an airplane. It was called a transformer. So the essence of what it was, it was more than what it looked like in the package, More than meets the eye. You are more than what you look like in your package. You are more than meets the eye. But if you don't know that, then you will struggle with trying to, turn your, trying to be turned from a robot to an airplane. Can I tell you that a lot of us act like turkeys, but we're supposed to be eagles. And the difference now, I was astonished the first time I saw a turkey fly. They can't fly. But they can't fly nowhere near as high as an eagle. Amen. And so with, with, with us being representative of God, we've got to do something 
that causes us to change the way we see ourselves in the sight of other people. Listen to me well. You can never change the way you see yourself in the sight of God. You cannot change the way he sees you in his sight. You can't change the way you see yourself in the sight of God. I didn't make a mistake when I said it. Some of you are like, what? Because, see, when God came on board, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when God came into my life and made me a new creature, a new creation that never existed before, I am forever transformed into that creature. Now, the only challenge is my mind doesn't always accept that. Right? You can write this down. I'm, I'm going to try to be good now. Okay. I'm going to try to be good. Insecurity. I'm going to tell you. I said it. I was talking to Apostle Walter the other day. I, I said more than you probably care to hear. But I'm going to tell you the one thing that's most dangerous in any relationship. It ain't just jealousy. Somebody said jealousy. That's a dangerous one. But insecurity is greater. Because jealousy is rooted in insecurity. If I can't trust my wife to go out without me, and then I get jealous, I'm really afraid. Because I really think that I ain't got enough to keep her attention. And insecure people permeate the church. And when you sit, <laughs> pull, pull your toes in. When you sit next to somebody who doesn't know who they are, you forever, you forever find yourself. Now, I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about from the married context now. If she and I, as being compatible and, and getting ready to celebrate 36 years of marriage, and, 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 and one of us is insecure, then I've always got to find myself walking around making sure that I don't step on her toes. Overly sensitive people are insecure. Am I right about it? So then what, what, is the, what is the problem? And it's amazing how, to me, everybody that's insecure, they do this, they do this thing with their, with their identification. They always subtly talk down, in a passive-aggressive way, talk down about themselves. Oh, I, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Uh, all of a sudden, it's like, well, you know, I'm not really all that special. Well, baby, let me tell you something. If it's just you, you're right. If it's just Tommy, we're not that special. I'm not that special. But it's not just Tommy. As of December the 31st, 1991, it stopped being just Tommy. That was my birthday. That was my spiritual birthday, my born again day. Aren't you born again? Well, if you got born again, did you get half born again? So, so point being is that my identity, in order for me to see myself as a, a value to the kingdom, it doesn't matter what my skin color is, what my gender is, doesn't matter where I'm from or where I'm not from, doesn't matter what degree I do or do not have. The only thing that matters is that my identity is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. And insecure people in the church are dangerous, Robin. Because when you go to try to pray for them, or they say something like, um, Kelsey, they say something like, uh, well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. We all know how that's, that, that goes around here. But when you try to go to bless them, they, 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 they don't, I'm not worthy. They, they back off you. I heard somebody say this when we were receiving an offering. There is such a thing as a twice sown seed. You're witnessing a person right now who somebody else sold into when, when, when nobody else had any, saw me as having any value. But somebody saw something in me, right, that caused them to take the time to preach to me, teach to me in, in small group settings, mostly small churches. And what they were doing is they were sowing into me so that God could pull something out of me many years later. But if I'm, if I'm not receptive to that and I just say, well, you know, it's hard for me to do that because I don't do that. People say, well, you know, you, you, you know, Brother Copeland taught us years ago, you know, if people brag on you because the way you teach and preach, you just ignore it. Give glory to God. But also if they talk bad about you because the way you preach and teach, you ignore that too. Somebody say, well, Pastor, you preached a good message. Glory to God. I didn't like your message. Glory to God. That's your problem, not mine. 
But see, because what we have to do is understand that what the enemy is doing is he is subtly trying to keep us in a place of always thinking that it is us doing something more than what we are doing or not doing. Oh, God, I wish I could. Last weekend, the Lord said this, and, and, and the gentleman that was here uh, and his wife, David and Lori Stroman, uh, he, he, he and I were talking throughout the course of the week, and, and he said something to me, reminded me of what the Lord said, and I was sharing it with Linda and, and Pastor Net, and that is this. God, God has more assignments to give than what we will receive. He got more, more for us to do than what we will receive. In this room could be somebody more powerful, more prolific than Billy Graham. And the only difference, listen, the only difference is how yielded are you to you be used by God? Well, you know, and we come up with so many excuses. If you got a spouse, you got a significant other, you got a mate, you got somebody that you're dating, according, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's in your life, and all they do is come up with excuses why they don't come, don't honor the relationship, you got a problem. And we allow ourselves to be so, so loose with our dishonor of God. Oh, let me slow down. Let me keep going. Okay, let's go. So I say that insecurity, it, to me, you don't have to write it down this way, but I think it's the bane of Christianity. I think, I think insecure people are what hold the body of Christ back. I think insecure people are the ones that hold the church back. And they certainly affect their calling and effectiveness in the kingdom. You can say whatever you want to say about Tommy Roberts, but, but at the end of the day, Tommy Roberts knows two things. I know that I am loved by God, and I know where I'm going when this thing is done. And then look, look, am I perfect? Not unless Jesus makes me that way, baby. I could tell y'all some stuff might make y'all never come back to this church again. That's you. But I ain't gonna ask you to tell me something about you. Oh, what'd he do? <laughs> we sang, and, and, and listen, let me keep going. We sang a couple songs today during praise and worship, and none of this stuff is orchestrated except by the Holy Ghost. What does it say? Let, let all the other names fade away. So I wrote this down. Your name must fade away until there's only Jesus. And most of us want to keep our identity. Ooh, boy, that, 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 I, I, it's more important that I be Tommy than I be used by God. So when, when Tommy runs up against something that's, that I can't see how God could, could, could deal with that in my life or in my financial realm or in my reach of the ministry, what happens is I shy away and all of a sudden I have put me back on the throne and taken Jesus off. I can't preach like Pastor Tommy. You ain't supposed to. I, t I tell, tell Zach, 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 you know, I've had conversations, you know, since, since he's been coming here. He's got a calling to, to prison ministry, okay? I do too. But I may not make it back to the prison in the frequency that I used to when we first started out because my responsibilities are greater now. Ain't no reason why he can't go. Too many in the church wait for permission. God, help me this morning. We wait for some other man to say, Dave, you can go now. What you waiting on? The Holy Ghost has already changed you, quickened your spirit, made you alive, made you one spirit with the Father. Then just go and tell somebody, say something to somebody. So all the other names have to fade away. Another song is saying, you are not forsaken. You are chosen. I am who you say I am. Listen, I love you, but I'm not who Lynette says I am. <laughs> I could really meddle right here. Could really meddle, but I better not meddle. Too many of us are still concerned about what other people have called us or said to us. When, we, when, when just a side note here, when, when my wife and I left uh, Heritage of Faith, um, and when I told, now this is true about, I shouldn't, let me qualify it the right way. Every church that I've been a part of, I've never left without, without, listen, without the blessing. Hear me well now. Pull your religious toes in. I did leave sometimes without permission. Come on now. There's a difference. I learned early on, and I can't say that, you know, I mean, my dad was a pastor, so that might have had something to do with it, just listening to some of he and my mom's conversations. But, but I learned through the teaching ministry of Kenneth Copeland and others that we were listening to that it's all, the blessing is very important over your life. 
And I can't tell you how many people don't know that and don't believe it. It's getting ready to get tidy. I told you I could meddle. Okay, I'm not intentionally meddling, but I'm going to tell you all the truth. If you are a part of this church and you've signed up through the partnership covenant, we go through this, we go through this every time we go through the partnership covenant. So, okay, nobody who's been through this say, I didn't know that. I didn't hear that. Yes, you did. You might not have read, you might not have went back and read what you, what you, you might not have read the fine print. We might not explain it, but it was on the paper. Listen to me well now. And I'm not throwing shade. I'm not trying to throw stones at nobody. All I'm telling you is that when it came time, I knew how important it was for me to leave one house in order to go to another. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's important when you leave one job, how you leave that job and go to another. Even in the day when people have multiple jobs, it's still important that you leave with integrity. We are Christians. We don't get to just throw integrity to the wind. I'm preaching, but y'all say amen. So when we left the house, we left the house, you know, I'm talking about a church house now. I told the pastor, who then was the authority over my life spiritually, I told him, listen, it's time for God. God has called us to separate. And again, whether they agreed or not, they had to admit that I had been faithful. They had to admit that I had walked in integrity. My wife and I walked in integrity. So when the time came, they may not want to let you go. But you better know the voice of God. You might want to leave here. And I may not want to let you go because I think you, you, you're gifted, anointed, empowered by God. But I'm smart enough to know that if God lets you, if, God, if I do this the right way, when you go out, somebody else is waiting in the wings. I said, I said this last week. I didn't mean it bad. I thought about it later. I, said, I probably shouldn't have said that. One monkey don't stop no show. Y'all ever heard that term? I know it's old school. Somewhere. One monkey don't stop no show. And look, I'm not calling you a monkey. I'm not saying anything about you. I'm just saying that if it's time for you to leave, leave, depart with integrity, with, 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 with the anointing of God. Let me pray over you, say in the name of Jesus, Father, enlarge her territory, strengthen her cords, lengthen her testicles, bring her to a place of grace. And she's not leaving. I'm just using her as an illustration. But she got an anointing on her life. So we did that, and, and, and God has done that, and he's proven true to his word all the, all the while. Well, why is that, that blessing important? Because that blessing helps me identify who I am. Yeah. It helps me know. And so I, I use this, you know, there's only one place I ever worked a job that I know that if they had the resources and could fit me back in, they'd take me. There's only one place that, that I, they wouldn't want me back, and I wouldn't want to go back there. It was a convenience store, and they can have that job. And I'm not knocking anybody that's working there, okay? All right, y'all all right? So the first thing we're going to have to understand, write this down, you are being transformed from old to new. You are being transformed from old to new. You simply, when you, came, you and I came into the earth, we were, just, we were just dead in sin. Amen. It just, it's, you didn't do anything to be dead in sin other than be born. So because you were born, you, you, you need to be transformed. And again, now what's going to happen? The Bible says, Paul says in Romans, don't be conformed to this world, to the day of the age. Now listen to me, pull your religious toes in. I might say this, have to say this several times today, but I shouldn't with this group. In other words, if the world decides that it's okay for me to, to, to have sex out of wedlock, God says no. So I'm not going to conform myself. If I got a man in my life who's not willing to wait, maybe he's not the man. If I got a woman that's always pushing up on me and she ain't doing right, and I'm trying to do right, maybe she's not the one. Because I can't afford to conform, I must be transformed. And in order to transform, you're going to have to step out of the mold of the world. Now, the, the world's pushing you and I every day. It's pushing you and I to compromise. It's pushing you and I to say the wrong thing. It's pushing you and I to do the wrong thing. I had a conversation with somebody just on yesterday, and, and, and they, they said that they ran up against some opposition in the church. I'm not going to name no names, I'm just saying. And they felt like they wanted to lash out, like, bless God, you know. We, 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 but you're in church. Now listen, listen, listen. Surprise. It don't happen just in church. Only difference about it happening in church is you ain't expecting to rise up. I, you know what I say, rise up, bow up. See, that's that, that's that old bow up. My daddy would say, my daddy would say what you think you, he, he might say, you think you bag now, or big now? No, he said, you going to rise up against me? You going to bow up? Otherwise, I'm get swole, what you all swole for? Look like an old toad or a bullfrog, you feeling me? 
And we think somehow or another, that's unusual. No, the only unusual thing is when it happens in the church. But why is it unusual? Because we still are human beings who feel the pains of this life. And unless I have emotional maturity or EQ as we call it, unless I have emotional maturity, I might want to say something I shouldn't say to somebody. But then that, then that puts me from being transformed into conformed. You can't think for one minute, well, I couldn't help myself. You're lying. Thank you. I just had to say it. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I, you know, you didn't see the way what she did. God did. And he was expecting that you would say, God help you. That you would see what he saw. That the person in order for them to lash out at you, something must be going on in their life. And they must not know what you know. More importantly, they probably don't know who you know. Oh, let me keep going. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Transform from the old new. Romans 3, 24 through 20, 21 through 24. Put it up in the message, please. Romans 3, 21 through 24. It says, but in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets, prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. Whatever they witnessed to, this has already happened. The God setting things right, come on now, that we read about or read about has become Jesus setting things right. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. Can you say amen? Did he, did he set it right or are we just playing church? Come on now. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. Now, I'm going to tell you, I like this translation because it doesn't say that he is setting them right. It means and implies that he has set them right. It's already done. And what we do is we go to churches where we feel like we got to get worthy. We got to get clean again. We got to get holy again. We got to get righteous again. No, what you got to do is get out of your own identity and stop having this crisis that simply many times turns into a pity party and you want somebody else to come in and join in. Oh, you know, oh, pastor. Oh, pastor. We go to prayer and, and, and instead of praying for the interceding for people, we got to stand in a circle around you all, every week. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing. That's okay. Week after week after week after week. This is a tough church to be at, man. I ain't playing. A am I right about it? This is a tough church to be at. It's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to, God, God, look, God don't care nothing about this earth suit, this dirt bag that you got. He transformed it. It's enriched dirt now. It's better than uranium. It's better than plutonium. Now the power of God rests on it. And he wants you to stand up. Stand up, man of God. He wants you to stand up with your shoulders square and your back straight and declare, I know who I am. Dare the devil to take a swing at you. You ain't going to run. You ain't going to duck. You're going to swing back. Bible says that if you submit yourself, therefore, unto that mighty hand of God, then in due time will he exalt you. But he also says that you submit yourself, therefore, to God, and the devil resists the devil, and he will flee from you. What's weak? Oh, God help me. <laughs> All right, let me keep going. Hallelujah. For there he says, he says here that God has set things right. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record <laughs> as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. Do you see that? Yeah. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess. God help me this morning. I could preach on somebody's mess all day long. It would be my mess, not yours. I wouldn't talk about your mess because I don't know about your mess. I don't care about your mess. Nosy people, gossipers, naysayers, and backbiters care about your mess. My God, want to ostracize you because you got a past. Ain't nobody in here that ain't got a past. You all got one. Yours might be dressed up a little bit better than mine, but you still got one. And if we're going to go into the closet and pull out skeletons, let's start at your house. No, Pastor, I want to start at your house. No, I'm starting at your house. <laughs> I freely admit my skeleton, baby. I, I, I told him last, last weekend, look, and I'm smart enough to know, I ain't, I'm smart enough to know that if I'm going to really do this thing right, baby, open my phone and look up any number you want to look at. 
Help me somebody. God, God, yeah, she, she don't care. She set it down. She know. It sits on my dresser all night long. I ain't worried about it. I remember one time, I'm going to tell on myself now. Thank you, Robin. We were sitting up, we, we were living over in Tiffin, I can't remember, and we were going through some stuff. It was tough, man, especially when we first started out. Couldn't get nobody to come to church. I'm going to be preaching my heart out. Couldn't, no, couldn't nobody come to church hardly. The Bells were in church. Cynthia was in church, and many of you other ones, but nobody else was coming to church. We were sitting upstairs one night, and, and I can't remember. And usually, here's, listen to me well. This is a good lesson to learn. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Most of the time when, when, when ministry vessels, not just me because I'm preaching, but if somebody gets up here and delivers the word, if it's Janice or Elder Dave, they're up here delivering the word. Mike, they get up here. When they get done, they're more vulnerable then than they are any other time. And the devil will send somebody well-meaning to say, well, you know, bless God, I appreciated the word, Brother Dave, but I didn't like the tie that you had on. And he ain't hear nothing about appreciate the word because the devil accentuated and emphasized the bad tie choice. He got a pretty tie on. But that's what people do to you. They do something as silly as that. So we were vulnerable. Man, that night, I had my phone and I was laying in the bed. And I like, yeah, she looks, she's like, oh, yeah, she know that. And, 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 and so I like to, uh, you know, I like to look at, at news. I do watch news. I got one favorite channel that I watch on my phone. I was watching something. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I realized that she wasn't asleep. And that baby's fine. You ain't, that baby's fine. I'm just telling you, but let that, be, that baby's fine. It ain't bothering me. If it's bothering you, pull your religious toes in, amen? You used to scream and holler like that too. You just don't remember. Mama got her in church. You feeling me? Yeah, that was last month. <laughs> and so I had my phone, and all of a sudden I realized that she had rolled over, she could see the light. And she said, what are you looking at? It was like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. What are you looking at? And the way she said it didn't imply she was curious. <laughs> she, she was being very inquisitive. I want to know what you're looking at. You feeling me? But see, I'm just telling you, man, this stuff happens. This is reality. But, but my life has to be an open book because if I can't be an open book before you, that doesn't mean I'm going to walk all the time. And, and don't put me on no pedestals, baby. I don't deserve the right to be on the pedestal. I'm not going to let you because if you put me on a pedestal, all I'm going to do is have the tendency to fall. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. So he did this, and he, and he did it by means of Jesus Christ. Point number two, everybody needs restoration. Everybody needs restoration. Everybody needs restoration. Turn, give me Philippians 2 uh, from the Message Bible, please. Verse 12, Philippians 2. Verse 12 from the Message Bible. Are you all right? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Philippians 2, verse 12. He says, what I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Tell your neighbor, keep it up. He goes on to say, better yet, redouble your efforts. Say, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation. God, help me. Deliver me from Eeyore-type saints. Eeyore-type saints. I should have put that in my notes. I didn't, you could have put a picture of Eeyore up there if I had been in the spirit, you know what I'm saying? Eeyore type saints. How you doing? Well, bless God. I'm here by God's grace. But let me tell you, no, no, don't tell me. You do not want Eeyore at the door. People come into church, they're excited to get here, and they run into you a wet Eeyore blanket. Well, how you doing? You're supposed to be the one lifting them up. They get here, and they, could you pray for me? I just need deliverance. Yeah, you sure do. <laughs> hey, man, let me keep going. He says, better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic. Come on, be energetic in your life of salvation. Reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, and energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at will, what will give him the most pleasure. And give, me, give, me, give, me the, uh, give me the King James Version here, please. 12, 12 and 13. Keep going. I know you got to get there. Give me, give me that. Uh, but the, the scripture says that it is God and implies this. And I want you to hear this. It's God working in you and I. He didn't leave you out here on your own. How are you going to do this without God? My God, I got God, and I know. Look, I don't, I don't believe in them old uh, 
unbelieving songs, trudging up the rough side of the mountain. You know, devil was on my track. I can't turn back. Look, I ain't looking back, baby. It takes all of my focus to look for, God help me, to keep my eyes on the prize, to continue to press toward the mark of the high calling, which is only in Christ Jesus. My God, wherefore my beloved, you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how, now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with reverential fear and trembling. Don't move off of that verse. Many of us are too busy concerned being concerned about other people's salvation. And in the process of being concerned about somebody else's salvation, then the next thing you know, you get off track like three degrees. Next thing you know, you on a slide somewhere. You don't even know how you got out here. You stop coming to church. You stop believing in God. You stop living by faith. You stop worshiping. You stop praising. And the next thing you know, you are in a place that even only God can get you out of. And we want to say, well, that church, that church didn't do nothing but love you, baby. And even if they didn't, you still have an obligation to serve God. Work out your own salvation. Stop being a wimp in God's presence. Danger to all wimps and wusses. I did say that. Do I need to say it again? Danger, 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 Will Robinson. Danger to all wimps and wusses out there. You are a spiritual wimp and ain't got no strength because you don't know who you are. You think it's you and it is God that work is, is working. Baby, it is God. St stand up. Come here. Come here. Somebody quit. It is God that's pushing you. He's like, come on, boy. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. I got you. I got you. I got Then He says, stop right here. I got something for you to do. Now let's go again. He definitely is good. God's working in you, trying to get his mission accomplished. Amen? Glory to God. I preach myself happy. Verse 14, verse 14 from the Message Bible. Do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. I told a pastor the other day, call me. I said, my, one of my greatest, greatest, uh, one of my greatest uh, anointings and perceptions is to come against, come against the spirit of division in the church. Because people will come in, they will come in and sit down next to you. I'm just waiting for it to do right because I know I'm doing right. And they will get next to you and do that thing cause static and friction, <laughs> sending off bad vibes. Can't even hear the, can't even hear the preacher because the static going on because they talking in your ear. Amen. 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 Doing good. They get all up next to you and want to whisper in your ear and try to figure out why are you happy and they not? And they don't really want your anointing to rub off on them. They want their poison to seep into your system. So they poison the, the, they poison the name of the, of, the, of the pastor. They poison the name of the pastors. They poison the name of the worship leader. Leading captive silly women laden with sin, the scripture says. And it's not just inferring women. It's talking about people who have no discipline in their lives. They'll pull you out every time. They'll yank you. They'll try to yank you. They'll try to yank you because they're going somewhere and they want you to go with them. But they say that, you know, anyway, let me keep going. Number three, is God really in control? I don't know if I really get past this one, but is God really in control? I think it's way too easy for us to say amen to this one. I know it has been in my life. Many times I thought God was in control. Turn to find, come to find out it was just Tommy. I was just talking. I was just blowing smoke. My heart wasn't engaged with God. Come to church and go through the motions. Ain't spent no quality time with God. Help me, Lord. Help me, help me, help me, Lord. Everybody defines quality time a different way. You ain't got to have a morning devotional to be in quality time with God. But by the same token, you better find some time to have a devotional in order to... Absence of the word. Doing things because it just feels right to your flesh. 
and yet there is no glory of God in it. Walking by people every day who don't know him and being mum and silent on the glorious king who made all this possible. People, I, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, a lot of stuff God gives me, I, I'm smart enough to just put, take it down, write it down, and then try to put it all together as the Holy Spirit allows me. And um, he took me to Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 6. Go there for me real quick. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 6. Thank you, Father. And as we were driving the other day, I was sitting in a traffic light. Once you get there, just say amen and look up at me. Don't start, don't start reading because I want you to stay with me. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1 through 6. When you get there, just hold it. Look up at me. Let me, let me know that you've got it. Have some water, please. Glory to God. <coughs> Thank you. Look up at me when you get it. Deuteronomy 29, verse 1 through 6. I was sitting in a traffic light just the other day. And this thought came to me and I, I shared it with my wife. I said, you know, I get a sense that the Lord is telling me. Now, let me say this before I say this. The messages that I preach are handcrafted by the Holy Ghost for you that's in this room. If somebody else gets something out of it, <clears throat> those that are watching by YouTube get something out of it, that's great. But they're handcrafted for the people of this fellowship. Take that and make sure you meditate on that. And so I was sitting at the traffic light, and the Holy Spirit said this to me. How, how control of your own life are you really? Or do you think you are? And I, and I got to thinking about that thing. I said, you know, I'm really not. Because you say what you want. You didn't wake yourself up this morning. Even if you didn't use an alarm clock, you didn't wake yourself up this morning. And I know people, you know, and I believe that too. Angels of the Lord wake you up. That's great. But you didn't wake yourself up. <clears throat> you don't keep your heart beating. Amen. Amen. Now, some would say, well, you know, my words, I get that. But accept your words, be empowered by the Holy God, help me. By the Holy Ghost and faith. Because the Bible says what? Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 4, that the word did not profit them not being mixed with faith. So don't tell me, you know, and, and what he was saying to me, and here's what he did. He showed me this. He said, look at, look at the traffic light. So we're sitting right there <clears throat> at uh, the corner of uh, um, 965 right there by the Walgreens and come and go to the left, Holiday Road. And we were waiting for the traffic light to change. And he said, there, every one of these cars could keep going, except there's an authority that they recognize in that traffic light. And there are people that happen, that this happens to all the time. They've got the green light and somebody else doesn't recognize the authority of the red light and comes through and sideswipes them. Isn't that, isn't that true? The devil would love to be the one to sideswipe you, except you, be, except you obey the, 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 the authority of the traffic light in your life, which is the Holy Ghost. That's a good way of putting him. He says stop. If it's a red light, you stop. Go no further. Go no further. If it's green, you go with all your gusto. You keep driving and driving and driving. If he says you need more gas, you need to get back in prayer. People who stop coming to church, it is the hardest thing to start going to church once you stop going. Say amen. That's the truth. Because you have developed a habit of, 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 of a lack of attendance. Yeah. Now, this is getting irritating. It's irritating me. I can't turn it off. Somebody said, you don't need it. But the folks that are watching by YouTube couldn't. They'd be like, because <laughs> they can't hear nothing. <laughs> Glory to God. Maybe I need to hold it different. I'll put it outside my pocket. How about that? Glory to God. Say amen. Come on. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I'm almost finished. So what happens is, Again, and, and, and my point here uh, was that uh, uh, is God really in control? Because what happens is you got you to be spiritual now. You got to be spiritual. Are y'all spiritual? Yes. You know, anytime, anytime I can do something for God and choose not to do it because I feel like my flesh is limiting me, I have succumbed to a lower power. And it's called me. I'm not, I'm not throwing stones. There are times when you simply cannot make it. Help me, Lord. Okay. But then there are times when I could make it. But for the convenience of my own, I choose not to. We got to know the difference. A couple months ago, we had snow. 
on a Sunday? Did we not? You text me and ask me how the roads were in Iowa City because you were getting ready to make the trek from Muscatine. Do you remember what I told you? I told you pray and trust the angels of the Lord and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And she showed up that day and sat right there. She came, how far is Muscatine from where you come? 45 minutes. As she came, she said there were cars on the side of the road. I get all that. I did. Look, I'm not, look, don't, don't get spiritual on me now. Don't get all religious and holy and humble on me now. I'm telling you that we got we to gotta fine tune this thing. Because if we don't fine tune it, the next thing you know, we'll start making decisions that are easier for our flesh, but not necessarily pleasing to God. If I made, <clears throat> my wife and I, not, we're not bragging on us, we're just telling you the truth. The easy decision on our flesh back in 2008, 9, and particularly 10 was to go back to Texas. And I know, we just, I know we'd have succeeded and prospered there too. But I knew in my heart that I would be doing it for me and not for God. And people do it every day. Amen. Say amen. amen. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Come on, come on. <laughs> what you, oh man, I feel that. You're supposed to feel it because the Holy Ghost wants you to feel it. He wants you to sense it. Father, we sense your presence. We receive your presence. We receive your correction. We receive whatever it is that you have for us this morning. It's not always pretty. It's not always cute. It doesn't always feel good, but it is good as we receive your word in Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. amen. Let's keep going. So is God really in control? Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 6 says, these are the terms of the covenant that God commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel. Listen to this now. In the land of Moab, renewing, do you see that? Renewing the covenant he made with them at Horeb. You're going to have to go back and do your history, but the covenant that was established in Horeb was as much and more so for the time when they were imprisoned and getting ready to come out of captivity. Okay? He had, God always makes a promise in your life and a covenant with you to fulfill the promise before you ever get to the situation where you need the promise to be fulfilled. So if you ever get in a sickness situation, if disease ever comes on your body or tries to captivate your body, you got to go back to the place where you came into the knowledge and revelation that Jesus is the healer. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. He is the one who provided healing before I needed it. And that's what he did here. Amen. So what happened in 2 through 4 says, Moses called all Israel together and said, you've seen with your own eyes everything that God did in Egypt to Pharaoh and his servants and to the land itself. The massive trials to which you were eyewitnesses, the great signs and miracle wonders. But God didn't give you an understanding heart or perceptive eyes or attentive ears until right now. Why? Because if they had had, listen, many times we want to keep walking. I encourage those of you that are new, back in the faith, back coming to church again for a long time. You haven't been coming to church. Look, don't look at what things look like right now. They are going to change I assure you that if you just keep walking, if you just keep walking, don't quit. Even if your steps slow down and your knees don't want to lift and your ankles hurt and your feet get tired and you just got barely in his strength, then stand there. And the Bible says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Wait a minute. Let God speak to you again and he will give you the energy because we read over Philippians 2 that it is God who works in you. He hasn't left you. He is going to get you to the destination. The race is not given to those who get there quickly. So God didn't give them an understanding heart. Verse 5 and 6 says, I took you through the wilderness, come on now, for 40 years, and through all that time, the clothes on your backs didn't wear out. 40 years of not needing new clothes? Come on, somebody. 40 years? And it don't matter whether they were in style, they never wore out. My God, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, would have, they must have been stretching because they were eating good. She said they must not have gained any weight. I don't know, but they never wore out. <laughs> he says all that time the clothes on your back didn't wear out. The sandals, he says the sandals on your feet didn't wear out and you lived well. Come on, now we got to stop living less than these brothers, these sisters. He says you live well without bread and wine and beer, proving that you are that to you that I am in fact God, your God. So number four, the Israelites came out restored. And if the Israelites came out restored, God would be less than God. God would be a liar. Come on, 
Somebody help me with that. God is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it? Shall he not perform it? He told you that you would be healed. You would live long and strong. He told you that you would be blessed. You would be ahead and not the tail. He told you that. Turn this off. Amen. He told you that. What are you waiting on to believe it? Well, you know, I don't fit. There you go, Eeyore at the door, man. Anybody want to be hanging out with that spirit? I don't hang out with nobody that's, I'm sorry. You say what you want to say. No, I'm not, I'm not sorry. You know, if you are, if you are, yes, amen. <laughs> Thank you. She helped me preach this morning. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Can I ask you a question? Are you a believer or not? What identifies you as a believer is what comes out your mouth. Not with your hands raised, but your mouth speaking. We having the same spirit of faith, therefore we speak. Well, I just don't feel it. That's your problem. You're living in feelings instead of faith. <laughs> Glory to God. For Exodus 12, 30 through 36. I'm going to end here because I can't keep going. I'm going to run out of time. Certainly ain't run out of words, but I'm going Exodus 12, 30 through 36, verse 30, the king, Pharaoh, his officers, and all the Egyptians got up during the night. Again, the point here is, is Israelites came out restored. Got up during the night because someone had died in every house. My God. It is a tragedy. God, help me in this place this morning. Too many people around us, we're letting too many people in our own houses die. And doing nothing about it. Because we don't know that we have the power to get them delivered. I mean, you know, I go back to my old Pentecostal roots sometimes, you know, and, and I get it. They didn't get everything right, and they didn't know all the Greek and the Hebrew, and they didn't have all the interlinear and all this kind of stuff, but, but they had power. They had an anointing. You know what I'm saying? They destroy, more, they destroy so many yolks up in there that they'd be making scrambled eggs. You know, you feeling what I'm saying? Demons leaping out of windows and jumping out of buildings. Couldn't hardly talk, could barely speak, could barely read and write, but the power of God was there. That's what we need in our church, but we got to have a, we got to stop having an identity crisis. People, you know, people dying, man. And so Pharaoh, they started, people, Pharaoh, it's funny, isn't it, Fair, isn't it funny that Pharaoh, and many people still serve a Pharaoh. Symbolically, still serve a Pharaoh. Mama said, I couldn't do this. She's a Pharaoh. If she ain't serving God and she ain't telling you the right way according to the word of God, she's a pharaoh. Daddy treated me bad. So what? I understand. But you're going to have to stop letting him, he, him or her be a pharaoh in your life and start allowing God to be God. He told, God, told, called, God told Gideon, he said, first thing I want you to do is destroy the idols of your father. Before I can use you, you got to let go of the past. You got to let go of those things that are important to you. Yes, they did it. And yes, it was wrong. My God, it was terrible. It was vile. It was contemptible. But, the, but God is the God who restores. He pulls you out of that thing. And he said, baby, I didn't let you die there. To me, come and say, well, where were you? He was, too, he was trying to get that person to do right. They wouldn't do right, but he sent a savior. He sent somebody along who would take you to church, take you to Sunday school when you didn't know nothing about him. And they put you on the bus or they brought you in their car. And the next thing you know, you grow up with all that baggage. But God, is, God doesn't see the baggage, baby. So he says here, and, and Pharaoh did not acknowledge God, did not acknowledge God until his own died. Many people need to let things die in our life. Devoted to the wrong thing. Got some folks who devoted to old churches, old ministers, old ministries. I love Dr. Savelle, but I'm not devoted to him. I'm devoted to God. I honor him. He's my spiritual father. But if I got a choice to make and I got to be here, unless it's something that I got to be there for him, I'm going to be here. This is where God called me, baby. Egyptians got up during the night because someone had died in every house. So there was a loud outcry everywhere in Egypt. 
I believe it to be true this day that there is going to be a loud outcry, not because people are dying, but because people recognize that they are tired of living a lie. And if I'm lying to me, everything else I say to you don't mean nothing. If I'm lying to me. Sit up here, look good, smell good, feel good, and then go home tonight and fussing with her. Strife, standing at the door, waiting for the garage door to go up. Say, yeah, they back. Come on in here, y'all. Y'all look kind of good. Strife starts by the, the, mo the moment we get in the car, the moment we get that little imp, the strife sends out a little imp to come, come our way. Y'all think I'm kidding, but I'm telling you the truth. Send that little henchman that way, and he'll, he'll start it at the door if he can. Get home and next thing you know, strife done into the house and can't figure out why we can't get no, no, no prayers answered, no power present. Yeah. Peace is the most important thing to she and I in our house. Yeah. If I don't take your phone call, it ain't because I don't like you, not because I don't love you. I might just need peace right now and I don't want to hear your problem. Nor do I want to hear your praise report. Leave it on the answer machine. Oh they ain't say amen to that one. No. I'll get back to you, I promise. And I'm going to tell y'all something. Y'all know this. I'm going to tell people that might be watching. If you call Tommy Roberts and don't leave a message, I am not calling you back. I am not. That's, why I answer, that's what the answer machine is for. Because I can't get to you right now. Well, I called you. You didn't leave a message. What'd that mean to me? You know how many people call me in the course of a day? Beside the bill collectors, you know how many people call me in the course of a day? Y'all look at me like that. They call y'all too. <laughs> Let me hurry up. I'm running out of time. Verse 31 says, During the night, the king called for Moses and Aaron and said, Get up. Look at this, man. This is how we got to be. This is the posture we got to take. I'll pick it up next week by God's grace. Israelites came out restored. They couldn't come out restored until this happened. Things died around them. Should be things dying around you. Desire should die. You should, you should, your, the desire for pornography should be dying around our lives. The desire for excessive things, well, no matter if it's food or if it's entertainment or if it's, oh, I got to just have somebody touching me all the time. These things are not natural. They need to, excuse me, they're not supernatural. They need to die a natural death. Doesn't mean that you don't want somebody. Doesn't mean that you won't eat again. Doesn't mean that you won't be attracted to things, but let it die. During the night, the king, Moses, I mean, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, get up, leave my people, you and your people. Talking about the children of Israel. May, you may do as you have asked. Go and worship, serve the Lord. Verse 32, take all of your flocks and herds as you've asked and go. And also bless me. I like that part. Bless me. Told you, you don't leave a place without blessing. And, 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 and certainly those people that despitefully use you, you should be more willing to bless them than anybody else. Well, they were ugly to me. I'm not going to be ugly back. Oh, it's getting quiet. And Blessed quietness. So the people, look, I like this. I like this. He says, uh, the Egyptians also asked the Israelites to hurry, hurry and leave, saying, if you don't leave, we will die. We'll all die. Verse 34. So the people took their dough <laughs> before the yeast or the leaven was added. They wrapped the bowls for making dough in clothing and carried them on their shoulders. The Israelites, children of Israel, did what Moses told them to do and asked their Egyptian neighbors for things made of silver and gold and for clothing. Can I tell you that if they can walk out of Egypt as a people who did not have any more of a covenant other than It's cool to preach, right? Glory to God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The only way that, that it could be better for us, excuse me, for them than for us is if Jesus didn't come. See how important that, that see, see why that needs, 
Right then is when it cuts out. The only way the children of Israel could have more restoration in their lives coming out of Egypt than what we have today is if Jesus had not come. And because Jesus has come, the covenant that he made with us is greater because it's built on greater promises. We don't receive them because we have an identity crisis. I'm going to say this and I'm going to close with this. Let me read this last portion of this verse. Just set it up there. Just sit up there. I ain't going to pick it up again. I'm finishing. He told them to leave. They urged the Israelites to hurry and leave. And then they talked about all the things that they got. Verse 35, the Israelites did what Moses told them to do, asked their Egyptian neighbors for things made of silver and gold and for clothing. Now, can I say this and in, 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 in throw it in here just because you guys know this from your history lessons. You know, the reason why the Jews were so wealthy, right there, right there. They spoiled the Egyptians. What does the Bible say that Jesus did for us? Spoiled principalities and powers. Making an open show of them. In other words, there's not, there's not a devil, demon of poverty. There's not a demon of lack. There's not a demon of sickness. There's not a demon of disease. There's not a demon of, of, of bad marriage. There's not a demon of anything that, can, that has more power than you have resident in your being right this very moment. If the Bible says that you humble yourself, you submit yourself, therefore, to God, and resist the devil, most people want to just resist the devil, but they haven't submitted to God. You can't tell me I'm submitted to God when you're talking ugly about yourself or other people. Amen. Verse 36, last verse, the Lord caused the Egyptians to think favorably of them. And the Egyptians gave the people everything they asked for. So the Israelites took rich gifts from them. My God. They plundered, picked clean, picked them clean, the Egyptians. They picked them clean. You can write down Hebrews 8. We'll pick up there by God's grace next week. Hebrews, Hebrews 8. You read the whole chapter. If I told you what verse, then you just read one verse and say, I did it. Read the whole thing. Praise God. And, and, and as I said, if it were, <clears throat> I'm not preaching to the whole world. I'm preaching to a select group of believers. Now, I'm going to say something. Pull your religious toes in. I know you already have. If that, they've been chopped off and you still got them out. You don't have any, so that's why I said I don't have any. I talked to a friend of mine the other day, and we were talking, and uh, this is what he told me. I'm not going to mention their name. It's not important, but I'm going to tell you. This is what we talked about. <coughs> He said his wife, he's a pastor, his wife was, um, had decided that she didn't, now they both went to Bible school. They both uh, love the Lord, have raised their kids in church and so on and so forth, like some of you. And uh, I knew something was going on, but it, I didn't have permission of the Holy Ghost to, to, to say anything. Okay? I knew something was up. But because we love them, we're in friendship with them, whenever I talk to them or talk to, you know, him, I always ask how she's doing. And uh, he said, you know, I'm glad you asked. Now, this is the difference in asking too soon and waiting for the Holy Ghost. And I've known this for, we've known this for a couple of years, at least two and a half years. Something's been off, just off. You know, if people don't want to talk about it, then just pray for them. Don't push them. Nobody wants to be pushed. People bow up, you know. You push them, man, they rear up. And so I was talking to him, and he said, this is what he told me. He said, you know, he said she decided that she didn't want to go to church anymore. She said she just had had enough. She had, she had been told or expected that things were going to be different at this stage of her life. She'd been believing God and loving God for many years. And she wasn't seeing the fruit of it or the benefit. I'll just put it in plain terms, the benefit of it. I'm a Christianese. And it just became something that she did. And so 
I listened to him. I didn't inter- interrupt, which is, can be hard for me sometimes. You know. But I didn't interrupt. I listened. And he said, but you know what? He said a remarkable thing happened. He said, I did not push her. I just let her be her. Many times that's, that's important, especially in, in relationships, those of you that are in relationships. Just let the person be themselves. They might be doing something that you are totally against and goes, you know, I, I'm just going to say this. Maybe you've got somebody in your life that's living a homosexual lifestyle and you know within your heart of hearts that according to the word of God, that's not God. Don't get on them. Love them. Am I in the right church today? Love them. They might have a, a drug addiction. They might be, have, you know, any type of sex addiction. They might have something. Why not just love them? And thank God that at least he entrusted you with the knowledge of what they're going through and you with your Holy Ghost filled self will not run and tell somebody else what they're struggling with. So he told me, he said, man, he said, I'm glad you asked because last Sunday, and it's been going on for, I know it's been going on for a while. He said, but for the last two and a half months, she's found her way back into church again. He said, she went one Sunday and she asked me if I wanted to go. And he said, I really didn't want to, but I did. Now, he's a preacher, both of them. And he said, you know, I went and we had a good time and I could tell that God was really doing something, but I just left her alone. I just prayed for her. Then he said, you know, he told me later, he said, and then I asked her if she was going to go the next Sunday. She said, nope. Nope. And he said, okay. Can I stay with you? She said, I like that. You, you see what I'm saying here? He's connected and he's, he's, he knows who he is. So his missing that service was intentional to reconnect with his wife. There's a big difference in just staying at home and watching TV. And so he said the next time, this went on for about two and a half months. He said the last time she decided she was going to go to somewhere else in church. And I didn't go with her. She went, I went somewhere else. And we both had a good time, but we talked to each other like, you know what? It's time to get back in tune with God again. So God was working on her at XYZ Church and him at ABC Church, but because they live in the same house and they know who they are in Christ, they knew that the exploration was okay as long as they found their way back to God. You know, and many of us get so critical and harsh and, and you know, and, and I, I, I think Life Point's the best thing that ever happened to the kingdom here in Iowa. You may not think that. I do. But if, if, I'm, going to, if I'm going to require um, a mandatory enlistment, then that makes it tragically, um, what's the word? Inept. Tragically impotent if I've got to mandate that people come to the house of God. There are people that will call you out because you don't come to church. You know, I've made a few phone calls this week over the last couple of weeks with people I haven't seen. And I tell you this all the time, y'all think I'm kidding. They don't call me back. I leave a message, <laughs> right? Because I pre- practice what I preach. They don't call me back. I know who I am. And, and no matter who does or does not run the race that's been assigned to them, you still got to know who you are. I, I commission you and challenge you this day. Stand to your feet, please. I commission and challenge you this day to go back to the drawing board, as it were, of your life and remember the days of your salvation in its infancy. And remember how important it was for you, not somebody else, but for you, to sense the presence of God and to talk to him and to love on him. And then remember, you you had so much fun. Some of you, I can say this about some of you now, some of you are living this currently, but some of you have been long past the stage. Man, when when you first came to Life Point, I had one, I'm gonna tell on Janice Bell. I'm gonna tell Elder Bell. Can I tell on you? I'm gonna tell on you anyway. She don't care. (laughs) I came and I I, I remember having an opportunity to preach at Life Point before before it was Life Point. We started coming to Life Point in, in 2008. I know, I'm going to fix that. Okay. It was Life Point Church, and, I, and we came to Life Point Church. Matter of fact, I got a text from Pastor Randy this morning, and I was sitting right there. I used to be a pastor of Life Point Church. This is Life Point Christian Faith Center. 
not Life Point Church. And so with that, where, where, where's, where is, raise your hand. I told you this morning, raise your hand, you too, right there. You, you, you. Yeah. These two ladies have been, these are the only two ladies in this church that have been here longer than my wife and I. And I don't think Mandy was here before us. Because we were, we were there in the theater when they were still in the theater. Mandy. Mandy was. Mandy was. So she was in the theater. So, um, but, but anyway, I remember why I was saying it. So I was preaching one Sunday. I came as a guest. And, and uh, <laughs> she told me, Janice told me this later. And, you know, and I, you got to know who you are. This is all I'm saying this for. And when I got done preaching, somehow or another, we, it was later on. It wasn't right that same day or same week. It was some, some months later. She said, I remember hearing you preach, Pastor Tommy, and saying, you know what? That's the pastor of Life Point. Now, at the time, I was not. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. But the witness of the Spirit will always take you in the direction of the Spirit, as long as it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I appreciated it. I received, they're still here. They've been through many tough times. We've been through some ups and downs, but they're still here. Amen? And many of you as well. But that joy that they found when they first came, you got to go back and tell somebody again. These chairs that you see empty around here will always be empty if you don't tell anybody about this church. I'm going to put a special, I hear the Lord say this, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to close with this. So if you want to receive this prayer or this blessing, this empowerment, this endowment from God, you can raise your hands or affirm whatever the case is. There are many people that are professionals in this, in this room that have not told their peers about this church because they feel like either one, because it's not appropriate in their work setting, or two, they feel like people might see them differently if they came and saw them under the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. He's not wrong. He always tells the truth. I say to you that you don't know who you are. And they have, they have, and I hear the Lord say, directed to particularly professionals, they have watched the transformation of you. You have come into their inner circle. You have come into influence, place a position of influence in their life. And they want what you have, but they're not going to broach the subject. You know what will cause them to broach the subject? When somebody in their house dies, just like Pharaoh. And when the Pharaohs, when the Pharaohs firstborn died and all of those firstborn of every home died, guess what they did? Said, bless me. Did they say that? We just read it? Bless me. I say to you, bless them now before somebody dies. Bless them now by telling them, listen, give them a card. Hey, I go to LifePoint. Watch it on YouTube. I always tell people, no matter who they are, watch it on LifePoint first. I always tell people that. Watch it on YouTube, excuse me. Watch it on YouTube first, because then you know what to expect. Amen? So I encourage you. Let's get out here. There's cards out there. You can take cards with you. I don't, I don't want to, you know, last weekend's crowd was amazing. I thought it was great, you know. But we had as many people in the first service as we did in the second service. I mean, it may not look like it because it was wide open. But a lot of times people don't want to come sit cramped, crowded. They don't. They'd rather have it open. I'm not opening them doors till we get to around 75 people consistently. And we should be doing that now. There are people that are not here today that you know they're not here. You haven't seen them in a while. And it is not just the discipleship and training team to just reach out to them. If you know them and you haven't seen them and you got their number, call them. Find out what's going on. Amen? They don't answer, leave a message. Just loving you, bless you, miss you. So want to make sure everything's okay with you. If you ever need anything, you need to ride to church, got the van ministry, or I'll come pick you up. I've done that all my life, have we not? We've done it all our lives. Amen? Amen? Lift your hands to God. Father, we thank you and give you praise. I bless and empower your people and thank you, God, for what you have called them. They really are. They are the blessed of the Lord. There is no curse upon their lives. I come against every demonic influence, every generational soul tie that has tried to hold them in check and in bondage. I come against inferiority complexes in the name of Jesus. I come against wrong thinking in Jesus' name. And we declare that their minds are alert and sound and in tune with the Holy Spirit so that they think correctly about themselves and more importantly about you. So you do not define them by what their past says or even what they did this morning or what came out of their mouth this morning if it was an error. But rather they repent and continue to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash over their sins and remove them as a stream, a river that flows from the throne of God and never to be seen again as they go into the sea of forgetfulness. I thank you for it, Father. I give you praise for these 
amazing people of God. What a blessing to serve in this capacity with them. I am so honored, Lynette is so honored to be able to call them our friends, our team, our members, our partners in the faith, God, as we work towards a family gathering which will take place at the throne of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're excited about it, we look forward to it, and we don't want to go alone. So we call them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Those people that we don't think would respond, you call them to respond. We'll do what you say, and we'll do it by faith. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen.